Hey, welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. We are really lucky today. We are outside at City Field, New York City, big Spartan Stadium race. Uh, we had a phenomenal interview today. I just want to mention, we're recording outside. We got planes going over. We got them uh, out seating the field. Uh, there's an Amtrak station nearby. Right next door. <laughs> but you know what? It's a perfect environment to talk to somebody like Mara Skiavacampo. Uh, she works in New York City. She's a TV personality. Good morning, America. She, um, she's now in the Dr. Oz show. But Joe, when you were interviewing her, she was talking about ending our abusive relationship with food. What a cool way to put that. Yeah, you know, I don't want to give anything away because this interview, I think, will change your life um, if you've got any issues with food, and I think we all do. But she talks about, I'm going to tease it, she talks about a funeral. Yep. I'll leave it at that. Dun, now, who the heck dun, are we? Dun, dun. We got Colonel Nye all the way on my right. Right here? Literally from the Special Forces. We got Dr. Sp Johnny right out of the hospital. We got Joe, the founder of Spartan. <laughs> And we got Dr. Sephra, the seed huntress on my Straight left. from the fields. Marion is producing from behind the camera. What do we do? We are your resiliency and grit experts. We're in your house every single day, but we can't get in your front door unless you subscribe. How do you subscribe? Go to YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. Go to iTunes if you're listening on iTunes and subscribe. Check us out. We'll be there every day. We will make sure you stay on track. Stay with us till the end of this thing because it will change your life. Stick around afterwards because our unique perspectives on uh, this great advice. I mean, Colonel I, your dietary habits might differ a little from Just a little. my foraging own or perhaps yours, Joe, Johnny. No, no, but the biggest thing here is we have our own perspective right. on how you can apply the lessons you're going to learn in this interview to your own life. So stay till the end. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Tiger Bomb Active. Trust Tiger Bomb Active for proven pain relief. Get new Tiger Bomb Active in gel, rub, and convenient spray. Or look for Tiger Bomb Active at select CVS and Rite Aid locations. Pain happens. Suffering, Suffering is, is optional. optional. We are here for the Spartan Up podcast, and we are with Mara Skiavacampo. Did I get that right? Perfect. You nailed it. All right. You grew up in New York? No, I'm from Maryland originally. You're from Maryland. Right outside of D.C. And although you've done really cool things and you do cool things now, I want to go way back. Let's go back. Because um, you're like a superpower. Uh, okay. And I want to <laughs> teach the audience like how they can become yeah. like you. So, yeah. so t talk to me about your childhood. Yeah. Um, so I grew up outside of D.C. Uh, my father worked for the World Bank. And so because of that, we did a lot of traveling, tons of travel. We lived overseas. We would travel any break we had. Where did you live overseas? Um, we lived in Somalia. But nice. before, you know, now it's a very different sure. place than it was. You know, I grew up in Somalia. Um, oh, and wow. at the time, you know, it had a government and it was, you know, not kind of the, the state of lawlessness that it is today. Day. Yeah. So my memories of Somalia are lovely, of a really happy, beautiful place. Brothers and sisters or just you? Yeah, so I have two siblings, um, a brother and a sister. My siblings are both adopted. Okay. Um, and so I mentioned when, that. Adopted when in they, Somalia? No, they were adopted at, at birth. Okay. Um, and they're older. I'm the baby. But I mentioned that because, you know, my upbringing was always very kind of tolerant and global. And um, those things were the foundation of, you know, everything else. Tolerant and global because you lived overseas and because you just... Your life was upheaved, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I mean, we saw so much. And when you grow up in the United States, you don't have the perspective of how privileged you are. You know, our definition of poverty still is so much farther above than people's definition of poverty in the third sure, world. Yeah. And so when you see the poorest people on the planet, it recalibrates everything. Um, and that was what I grew up with, you know, because we were living in a lot of developed, developing places. And sure. so I've seen literally the poorest people on the planet in the poorest conditions. And it just gives reset, you so reset. much perspective. Yeah, oh, I like that word perspective. I talk about frame of reference because um, when I was young up the street here in Queens, I, was, I started a business at a young age. Not having done it before, I hired, I tried, you know, hired some local people. The kids and they'd quit right away and then somehow I stumbled upon a couple of Polish guys kids and they were like, like they, they were stronger than they were right. like and it wasn't their business they wouldn't stop yeah work ethic the work it ethic and it was because of where they grew up yeah. and so I sound I'm probably annoying to other Americans and I'm an American when I say that but the reality is I don't think you could I don't think there's nothing like that living living around right because then 
when the going gets tough and the Wi-Fi is not working on the airplane right. or the Netflix doesn't come up. It's or the first coffee. world problems. Right? You have perspective. And yeah. I don't say that to minimize anyone's suffering, especially when you live in a society of abundance and you live in a place of lack. It's normal to feel, you know, what people feel when they sure. don't have opportunity and they don't have resources. Um, so I don't say that to minimize the struggles of people who are here, yeah. but it's a really different perspective when you see true, true global poverty. Did you, uh, when did you come back? So we came back when I was in the fourth grade, so it was like nine or ten. Can you recall back then, did you like all of a sudden become more grateful for... Not at the time, you know, because as a kid, these were all annoyances to me. Like, why do we have to go to this place? Why do we have to go to this place? And, you know, I didn't have, like, access to snacks or candy. Oh, snacks. So when we would come back to the States, it was like, oh, I can have noun laters. We don't have those there. So I remember just always being annoyed. Like, why do we have to go to these places? You know, we weren't going to, like, the Caribbean on vacation. (laughs) We were going to really challenging places. Um, But the gifts that that, that that perspective has given me, you know, has been immeasurable. And, and once you um, once you came back, by the way, your vocabulary is awesome. Is that from being? Thank a you. Music? That's the bro- that's the broadcaster in me. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> amazing. I gotta I gotta become a broadcaster or something. So so um, you come back and then did you do another trip or you? So we were traveling constantly, and, to, and okay. even when I was in college, my parents lived in the Philippines. So when I would go home on breaks from college, you, you know I where was home was going to the Philippines. Right. Um, so this continued. I mean, my parents finally settled down in around 2001 when I was in graduate school. So this was really my whole youth was travel, constant travel. So graduate school. So did they push you? Uh, and I ask these questions because I'm a parent and I want to know for myself selfishly. But like, did they push you and say college, college, college? What were they? You know, my parents are both academics. They both you know, have PhDs. My mom's a professor. So I'm a pleaser. So it was they didn't have to say anything. I just knew, you know, if I'm going to make them happy, I got to go go to school and go all the way. Like one degree is not enough. You got to go. I got to go. And nature versus nurture, your, your adopted siblings, same yeah. thing? Yeah. Um, we have very different paths. You know, so my brother was never a school guy, um, but he recognized that early on. He got his GED and he's carved, you okay. know, his own path in the world, but he's, you know, been very successful his way. Right. Um, and my sister, she went all the way in, in school, so, but she's a more creative type. So she did design for a while. So we're all very different. And then how do you land, uh, you, graduate school doesn't, were you studying this? Or? I was studying journalism, broadcast oh, you are. journalism. Okay, yeah. so you knew you were going to do this. Yeah, I knew I wanted a job that would allow me to write. That was all I cared about. And so when I looked at the options, like what careers allow you to write? Because you can't get a job as a novelist, right? I wanted a job. And journalism pretty much was the only thing that fit that criteria. You're a good writer. I enjoyed writing. You know, you have to ask other people if I was good at it, but I, li- I like you it. Like, you like doing it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when, you know, we talk about uh, true north a lot, like knowing your why. Mm. And, and one thing I like to say is, like, if you would do it anyway, even though you knew you'd fail, yeah. you, it's probably your true north. So yeah. you didn't care whether you're good or not. You just like writing. And it's the thing that I feel like is intrinsic to you. You know, when I was six years old, yeah. when I would spend my free time writing stories, right. it was always so intrinsic. When I was 13... You didn't even think about it. I didn't even think about it. I right. used to, like, fold a piece of paper in half and staple it on the sides and write novels. You know, it was the way That's that fine. I my, my spent daughter, time. My daughter does that, and I had never seen that. I, didn't, I can't write. Right. <laughs> so, But she staples. She makes her own books. You make your own books, yeah. yeah. So it was just what always came natural to me. All right, so you grad, where did you graduate? Uh, in New York? You were uh, in New York? No, I was at the University of Maryland. So I did my undergrad at UCLA. Okay. And then I did my uh, graduate work at University of Maryland. And your parents bought you way in? Or, or? Yeah, right, exactly. When I say, I'm like, they paid how much to get into UCLA? I got in the good old-fashioned way. Nice. Yeah. So, so you graduate and then easy to get a job as a journalist? You know, I got very lucky. Um, I, got, I had an internship at CBS News and while I was in graduate school. And then when I graduated, they had an entry-level job available. They knew me because of the internship, and that was my first job. So that's a good lesson for people listening, right, is um, start preparing for the job before sure. you hit the yeah. job market. Yeah, absolutely. And contacts, you know, are everything. You want to leave a good impression on people. I even told my nieces and, and nephews, why wouldn't you be going to the colleges you're thinking of getting into and getting to know the coaches? Absolutely, and, 100%. Right? So when you apply, at least there's a face to a name. And Absolutely. I mean, those connections are invaluable. invaluable. All right, so now you're working your way up at CBS. Yeah, so it's funny. You know, I really feel that you know, life is this combination of fate and serendipity and your own preparation and motivation and work. And I was sitting next to this guy who was on the phone describing to a job applicant what they needed to do to apply for a job that I wanted. I didn't know this. I didn't see a listing. I didn't know this job existed. But he's describing the job to them. And when he gets off the phone, I said, I want to apply for that job. (laughs) 
And it was as a reporter for MTV's College Network. Okay. And I was 23, so I was the perfect age to work for MTV's College Network. Sure. And he said, okay, um, and I will never forget this. The guy's name is Court Passant. This is at CBS News. This is at the network. He says, this I will. Is, this is 2000. 2003 ish. Three, okay. He says, I will send you out with a network cameraman for one day and I will put you with a network editor for one shift to make a reel, because I didn't have a reel. Sure. And looking back on it now, I mean, he gave me amazing resources. These are the best technical yeah, people right. you on the planet. Because you would have had to do it on your right, own. Right, exactly. And we didn't even have cell phones then, so I really would have been screwed. Um, so I went out with the guy, I made my reel, and, and I got the job. That was my first reporting job. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and from there, straight up, hockey um, stick? No, I wish. Uh, no. So then I went to local television, because you know you age out of college television very quickly. Got it. So after a year and a half, I had to find another job. I go to local television in Rye, New York, and I hated it. I, I hated it because it wasn't, I wasn't 60 minutes? No, or? I wasn't into what I was covering. I didn't want to be at, you oh. know, power board meetings, you know, oh, at 6 God. o'clock on a Wednesday night. Like, that just did not interest me at all. Right. And I wanted to travel. And so I quit my job and I bought a bunch of gear. It had to be small enough to fit in an overhead bin of an airplane right. because I didn't want to check it because I was afraid it would you get stolen it. or lost. Sure. Sure. And so I figured out how to get, and this is in 2005, I figured out how to get this equipment into a backpack and I started traveling the world producing news pieces. Well, unbeknownst to me, I was part of a very small group of people who were pioneering digital journalism because but, before so wait, that, so you your, couldn't do that. Your plan was to sell those to... I was a freelancer, right. but I wanted to do TV because I came from TV. So sure. typically freelancers are print. Right. And I thought, well, I'm going to do the same thing print freelancers do, but I'm going to do it for TV. Right. And I, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But today it's so easy. Right. But then it was really right. hard to think, how am I going to edit this? How am I going to transmit it? How am I going to shoot it? So what, how did you do that? So I bought a pirated copy of Final Cut Pro from a guy on Craigslist. I had nice. to meet him at the lobby of a bank. It was like a drug deal. It I was like, it. here are your CDs. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I paid like $25 for software that should like have cost $2,000. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, I bought a used video camera, Panasonic. Um, and I kind of just figured it out because the technology was just getting to a point where you could do it. Sure. And then I realized there were a couple other people that were doing the same thing and then we would talk and we would share information. And then when the networks found out what we were doing, they brought me in. I had meetings with everybody, ABC, NBC, and That's CNN. Awesome. And because for them, like, it's a home run, it's right? A, it's yeah. a, I mean, they're They don't have to keep you on payroll. You go get right. something, and if we yeah. like it, we buy it. Yeah, but then NBC hired me full-time, so then I, I was theirs. <laughs> but, but let's go back for a second. Before NBC hired you, how did you find the stories? Yeah, that's a great question. So most of that work was done on the ground. So I knew a lot about how to navigate other countries because of how I grew sure. up. So I would hire a local guide. And we would go around and we would figure out what the stories were. And oh, that's so you so you you weren't like let's say you wouldn't stay in New York and say there's something going on in Somalia you got to get out. Yes and no. So for example, there was a war you know between Lebanon and Israel in like right. 2006 I think, and I knew I wanted to be a part of what was yeah. happening. And so I went to Jordan, which is right by Lebanon, but was not part of the war. Sure. And I hired a guide and I said let's go to Lebanon. And so we drove in and we figured out what was happening and I shot a bunch of stuff and I sold it all. That's awesome. And then NBC hired you full time. And they hired me full time. And then you became like a big time anchor. I, I became a broadcast <laughs> <laughs> journalist, yes, <laughs> at the network level. Uh, right. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And and uh, you're still doing that now? No. Yeah. Yeah. So I left Good Morning America or late last year, and I'm with the Dr. Oz show now. I was with Dr. Oz yesterday. Were you really yeah. doing what? I did. A, I was on a show. Oh, okay. What was yeah. the topic? Um, Spartan. We talked about Spartan and it's being fantastic. healthy, and, and I, um, I, ha I have to say, he's, uh, I was pretty impressed with him. Yeah, he's impressive. He's impressive. He, um, unlike me, and more like you, you maybe you, you learned it from being in that environment, but uh, he doesn't multitask, like he's just engaged with you and very focused. Very focused. And so I'm learning. He's also a surgeon. He's also a surgeon, so you have to be focused. And he has that like, precision, and uh, he's very impressive. But what I was unimpressed with, maybe we could talk about, is there were like 40 people yeah, you hanging around. Like, you're probably thinking, what's everybody doing? What's everybody doing? But they all actually have very important jobs. <laughs> it takes a village. That's a serious village, It though. takes a like, village. I mean, usually we film, we have one person with a camera. Yeah, we don't think, yeah I mean, it takes a village. But you have to think, they have like the three studio cameras, they have the jib, you know, you have, you have a stage manager, you have props people, you have people who are cooking the food that you see on the show. I mean, it's a, it's a big, big endeavor. Big, big job. Yeah. So, um, so you're, you're with Dr. Oz now? No. Yes. You, yeah. you, that's awesome. Yeah. 
It's fun. Super pumped. Yeah. So why don't we take a break? Why don't you and I practice being focused? You could teach me how to be focused. Okay, we're going to do some And then when we come back, I want to get into this whole skinny thing because you are looking a little skinny. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, Spartans. We'll be back to this episode in a second. But we need to take a quick, um, quick time out. And we want to talk about our sponsor, Tiger Bomb. For me, this is, this is easy. Uh, I've been using Tiger Bomb since as long as I can remember. I can remember uh, being in high school, being in high school wrestling or high school cross country or high school track, but really cross country when you're out running in the little shorts back then in October and it was cold out and your muscles would tighten up, we put that Tiger Bomb on behind your knees, on your thighs, and, and I tell you, it made a world of difference, especially uh, before you went out into those elements. I mean, the cool thing is now they've modernized it, so now it's in a spray form. So now maybe as you've gotten a little bit older, yeah, a little bit, I, little bit. then lathering up with that bomb would be a little bit more difficult. Back of your neck, back right, of your legs right. and stuff after a run. So this stuff is pretty, yeah, that can get pretty easy. And so anyways, if you guys want to find this, get new Tiger Bomb Active in gel, rub, and convenient spray. Or look for Tiger Bomb Active at select CVS and Rite Aid locations. Pain happens. Suffering's optional, so come get some Tiger Bomb and enjoy the rest of this episode. I'm focused. I feel that energy. Yeah, so that was um, that was a great little thing we could share with the audience on how to become more focused right. later. But tell me about this this thing because you don't look like you have a weight problem. So what's the issue? Yeah, so I grew up um, heavy all my life, and it wasn't something that I really felt bad about. I tried to change at various points. You know, I tried dieting, of course, but it didn't work. Um, and then when I had my daughter. I had gained 40 pounds in pregnancy. Which would be normal. It's normal. Right. Um, I was 50 pounds overweight to begin with. Okay. And so my goal was to lose baby weight because I didn't want to go back to work in different clothes. How many, how many years ago was it? So she's seven now. She's seven, so okay, seven, seven years. years seven years. Right. So I decided, okay, I'm going to lose. I'm, I'm determined to figure this out. I'm going to lose this weight. But you're on TV at this I'm point. I'm on TV, and yeah. And you have no issue. People aren't. Right. And I so. always actually was very proud of the fact that I was plus size on television because I knew I was reflecting our audience that I was one person on TV who looked like our audience. You know, the, the, the country is very diverse. People, everybody's not a size two. But, but, but here's what I'm curious about. Were you feeling like unhealthy or, or were no, people but, saying something? Because you're on TV, right. top spot, right. you're beautiful. So like, what's the issue? Yeah. Tell me what happened. So, it, you know, health is relative. So I, I, at the time, defined health as the absence of illness. Got it. Okay. Today, I define health very differently because I know that there is a lot more beyond just not being sick. Got so was I healthy? Yes, I've been blessed with good health my entire life. Did I feel unconfident in front of the camera? No, I felt fine and I felt like I was reflecting the audience. And they hired me at that size. So I was almost like, I dare somebody to say something to me because you knew what you were getting when you hired me. But when I had my daughter, I was uncomfortably heavy. And so post, that was post, unco- after having okay, her because yeah. I had gained all this weight during pregnancy. Right. So that was the motivation for me is then I felt awful. So what was the plan? So that's the question, right? It's like I've tried before. It hasn't stuck. How am I going to make this really work? So I sat down and I made a list of all the things that are on my undoing, right? And I realized, and this is the single most important revelation of my health journey, there are certain foods I will never have a healthy relationship with, ever. Like? Like, uh... Pretty much any baked good. I never eat baked goods. You know, bagels, muffins, cupcakes. You mean, you cupcakes. mean when you were making the list, you were saying uh, we're no longer having a relationship the thing, together. The foods that I could not control, Got the it. ones that controlled Got me, the ones that I would say I'm just going to eat one and I would eat yeah. the whole sleeve yeah. every time. Yeah. And I said to myself, if you've been doing this every single time you've tried to eat one of these cookies and they're it no, always They're no longer you, friends. We're getting rid of them. We're not friends. Right. And I don't want an abusive relationship with anything, right. including a food. So it's got to go. So I mourned them. It was a mourning process. I grieved it. I said bye. And once I got rid of those foods, I was left with pretty much. I'm visualizing a really cool social video where you're like throwing muffins and all this stuff in a little like casket. (laughs) A funeral. Funeral. Right. 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 Yeah. We should. We should do that. Yeah. (laughs) And say goodbye. Say goodbye. Because my thing is, and I've had conversations. I've had debates with people who say, "Oh, restrictive dieting is bad." I don't consider this restrictive dieting. I'm eliminating something that I've been abusing. So why would it be good for me to keep it in my life? I agree. Um, And so once I got rid of those things, I was pretty much left with protein, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. Good foods. And that's been the basis of my diet for the last seven years. Seven years. And And I lost the weight effortlessly. Have you gone to the casket at all? Of course, I'm human. Yeah, I fall. I do fall. Yeah, yeah. But it's never a decision. So it's never like, okay, today's a special day. I'm going to allow myself a cheat meal. No, it's always because something's wrong in my life. Something's bothering me. Um, it's like a drug addict yeah, going back to I their agree. drug. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's always, it's not a good day. I always say, if you see me with a cookie, I'm not just indulging myself. There's something wrong with me. I could eat a whole pizza, but I don't, I don't eat pizza anymore. I don't right. eat bread anymore. I don't eat that. And yesterday I was at, in Queens at like the pizza place uh. and we were doing some filming and they go, oh, we're going to make you a pizza. <laughs> and I'm holding this pizza and I'm like, yeah, it was a tough yeah, situation. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. And pizza, I have found, when yeah. I do stumble and go back to my old ways, yeah. it's always better than I remembered. Yeah. Pizza's yeah. like the one thing that, oh. yeah, yeah, pizza's a, a hard one. Um, and then I started exercising for the first time. You weren't exercising this whole time? Not really. I mean, right. I would like, I lost 50 pounds before I set foot in the gym. So right. I always tell people, diet's first. You right. clean up your diet, you will be successful. Yeah. You don't clean it up, you'll never be successful. Before you get into exercise, what about um, drinks? What, what's your... A drink. Yeah, c- yeah, clear liquor, straight. <laughs> no, you don't do it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, before we get into that, because that's, that's not what I meant. Uh, <laughs> oh, you said drinks. <laughs> that, that's an issue, <laughs> but we can work what on it. What do you mean but, when you're talking about drinks? <laughs> well, I just meant, do you drink soda or juices? Oh, no, or? I never, I've always been only water. Water only, yeah. except for the straight alcohol. Except for the straight. I thought you meant alcohol. Because like, that's a common question people ask me all the time, because I don't drink wine. I got rid of wine. Right. So, you like straight vodka? What? I do vodka, gin, or tequila. Clear. Um, awesome. On the rocks. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's like a speed bump, right? Yeah. Because a glass of wine, I could finish that in two minutes. Got you it. know, a ch- uh, like a chilled cocktail. It's like lime juice and, and, and vodka. And do you find yourself... I don't, I don't drink, um, not because I had an issue. I don't like the taste. I'm okay. very lucky. So... Um, do you find yourself after you have one then you have because your defenses go down they do yeah and you have to be very very careful because then you're like oh I actually do want the cheesy bread (laughs) right because if there's a muffin nearby (laughs) then I'm in big big trouble (laughs) right how do you do what do you do I mean it's just at this point it's become so much habit Right. that I just am used to grabbing for other things. Because there's definitely times where I'll like graze just for volume, right. yeah. but I'm reaching for popcorn or nuts or right. those kinds of things. I find um, lightly salted almonds yeah. will solve, because I don't really like them, but mm-hmm. if I eat enough yeah. of them, then it's yeah. like I can't eat one of them, or I'm stuffed. Right, right, or like right. wasabi peas, because they're so spicy. Yeah. that Even a carrot, of, I'll eat yeah. three or four carrots just yeah. to like- Take the edge off. Take the, take the edge <laughs> off. <laughs> So you made it sound really easy, and obviously for most of the country, it's not easy. Not for right. me, it wasn't easy. So, like, uh, talk about the tough times. Yeah, and to be clear, it wasn't easy for me either. But I found that once that I found the solution. But it still took a lot of devotion Try, and dedication. Yeah, um, you know, I tried to lose weight most of my life, and I tried pretty much everything. You know, I remember being in college and taking ephedra and drinking slim fast shakes and going to run twice a day in the heat. In the summer. And nothing worked? No, that would work. It would take the weight off, and then it would come right back on. You can't sustain that. But now I'm thinking to myself, like, I literally could have died doing that. Like, you know, Fedra now is illegal. So there was that. Um, I joined this food cult that was very bizarre, where you had, like, a... Uh, a, a more experienced member that you were accountable to and you had to like tell fight them. club for yeah, food yeah kind of you had to like tell them what you were going to eat every day and if you yeah. didn't then they would like reprimand you like even if you didn't eat something you said you would oh, wow. it's not like oh i also ate a yeah. cupcake no it was like you said you were going to have peas for dinner and you had asparagus and that's a problem um so that was bizarre so there were a lot of things that were just psychologically um really kind of tricky and none of it none of it really none of it worked because this went on for how many years i mean i started my my fitness my wellness journey did not begin until i had my daughter and i was 32 you're 32 so so most of my life you know 15 years yeah more i mean i'm surprised i was about eight really you were thinking about it oh oh, yeah i was trying to lose weight when i was my parents sent me to weight watchers when i was like nine oh wow oh yeah so clearly the muffins um, yeah the muffin funeral the muffin funeral (laughs) (laughs) worked right Yeah, but it's all connected. It's all mind, body, soul, because then I had to ask myself when I got rid of that food, when I had the funeral, right? I said, okay, what am I going to fill this with? Because they were doing, they were really providing an important service in my life. And so now what am I going to fill that with? And that was a question I had to answer. So that led me to a lot of yoga. I'm doing yoga like three times a day, like little 10 minute, like stretching and then just to clear my head, Um, meditation, journaling, prayer. It led to all those other things because I I had to do something to keep me away from muffins, foods, muffins. Muffins are good. Yeah, muffins are delicious. I know, man. It's like, that's my crack. Muffin or yoga? (laughs) (laughs) I'm with you. Yeah. All right. So, so um, let's give the audience three things they can do. Um, because you know everybody wants like of course everybody wants three minute abs these days yeah right? yeah but abs make it simple don't, it's first of all it's not simple I mean I don't know if that's a tip but that's something that's that, a good tip 
Like, um, this is going to be harder than you think. It's going to be harder than you think. But here's what I remind myself. It's hard for everyone. And I didn't know that before. Before right. I started, thought it was just you. I thought it was just me. Right. So before I started hanging out with, you know, like-minded, really, like, fit people, I thought that, like, somebody who was shredded didn't want the pizza. Right. I was suffering. I really wanted the pizza. But they really wanted the salad. We have a special muffin gene. Right. right. But then I realized, no, they want to order the French toast at brunch as much as I do. But they're choosing the egg white omelet because their fitness It has to be, is- right? Because as you say that, I'm thinking, I mean, there's a lot of Starbucks out there. A lot, a lot of right? Frappuccinos. There's a lot of Frappuccinos, Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> so clearly the whole world has this the issue. The whole world has this issue. And that was comforting for me. Because then I thought, okay, well, they're doing it, so that means I can too. There's nothing different about them, and there's nothing weak about me. Right. They're just more committed. So and more discipline. More discipline. Right. Dis- it's discipline. Yeah. 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 Discipline. Um, and, you know, there's a distinction between discipline and motivation, because motivation comes right. and goes, right? But right. discipline is, you know, yeah. whether you want to or not. Right. Um, did you go public with it? Like, when you had the funeral, um, did you tell everybody? No. But when people started noticing that I was losing weight, from viewers to friends to family, and they would ask what I was doing, then I would tell them. That's exactly. why I wrote the book, because I kept repeating the same advice over and over again. And I was like, I'm just going to put this in write a book. book. Right. Give, 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 give a book. out yeah. copies. Yeah. 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 At the funeral. <laughs> At the funeral. <laughs> so in terms of like tangible tips, yeah. now some of these are One, it's going to be hard. One, it's going to be hard. Two, I weigh myself every day. Wow. Now, a lot of people don't morning like that idea in the morning. <laughs> morning, okay. Um, because they, it, they think it's going to play head games with people. It contributes to kind of like, you know, um, psychological discomfort. But if you can stop giving the scale so much weight, no pun intended, the scale's not judging you. The scale is not snickering at you because you are not where you want to be. Um, it's just a tool. It's a KPI. It's just right. a tool. And it, for me, it takes all the power away from it. Then I'm not like away in days on the 15th or it's on Monday sure. morning. It's every day. Or, every day. And so and what have you found yourself up a pound and a half? I And I've noticed how much my weight fluctuates so that to drop three pounds overnight is not unusual for me. Right. So now if I step and I'm three pounds up, I'm like, oh, okay, and I'll do it tomorrow. You might even make a subconscious change. You know what? I'll eat dinner earlier tonight. Right. right. It's, it's, it's not a, like a freak out. So I'm a big proponent Because of that. 30 pounds right. would be a freak out. For 30 pounds would be a freak out. But you're right. never going to be 30 pounds heavier from one if day you, to the if you next. Check, yeah, if you check it each day. <laughs> right. 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 Um, and then the third thing I would say is think about the foods that you abuse. And do you want to be in an abusive relationship? Right. I like that. We we got to start this funeral social media thing. I think this would be great. You're awesome. Thank you. So and if none of that works, move to Somalia. Right. Well, <laughs> then you have a whole different problem. <laughs> That's right. So I have a really good idea. You know, in the middle of the field at each race, we could have like a pastry pyre, and everyone can just bring their sweets and treats, and we just burn, burn it. it. Oh, I like yeah. that. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Say a prayer. It was, she's really smart, right? I mean, yeah. uh, I had never thought about. We I've had issues with food. We all have, right? right? And so this idea of, of literally just giving up a relationship with the specific foods that just you can't deal with, yep. it's like just kicking a friend out of the house. I, I like it. Yeah, but we've, we've, had a, we've had other guests say similar things, but it wasn't about food. I'm trying to think of uh, a wrestler, Carr. Who, oh, who, Nate who, Carr, who, right. Nate Carr, any negative wrote, thoughts. Any would, negative thoughts, he wrote them that, down, that crumpled them up, and, 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 got, and got rid of them. And there was one other, uh, I'm struggling to remember, who did a similar thing, kind of had a, a ceremony to get rid of things. But this was specific to food and her, her phrasing of why would you want to be in an abusive relationship. Yeah, it makes so much sense. Which is really, that you know, when it, somebody puts it to you like that, it, it's, it changes. Very your, obvious. It, it, and it changes the way you look at it, right? Yeah. You always talk frame of reference. And that really is, it really kind of puts it right in front of you. And death is rebirth, right? So, like, when one thing ends, another thing begins. And you so can only... Muffins, you out with the muffins, have, in with the celery. Yeah. You know, we got to move beyond celery. There's but, okay. <laughs> What other things jumped out at you, yeah, One thing that jumped out to me when she was talking about food is she said, you got to remember, hey, we just paused for a quick second for that plane there. The thing that really jumped out at me that she said was she said, you got to remember that that food was serving a purpose, that even the bad things, even the abusive things, you know, whether it's drugs or alcohol or food or whatever, relationships, for some reason, we're using those. And so when we take them out of our life, it's important that we plug something else in in its place. That was big. Yeah. That and, was and, big, you know, right? A lot of so people will do that. it with yoga and, and exactly, other things. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, you, you've talked about that before, too, about the idea that um, it was the whole idea of idle hands, right? Like, if you're going to take something out and you don't replace it with something else, um, it's just going to be a hole that's going to fall right back into. I agree. What jumped out at you, Colonel Knight? Well, I liked her, her early stories, kind of her developmental story, and that is... She had the opportunity to travel. Her family traveled when she was young 
I, I think she said her father was a World Bank, so they, they moved around a lot. And as we've discussed before, that gives it gives you an opportunity to see things in a different a different light, right? And she talked about being very tolerant because she's exposed to multiple cultures, multiple ideas. It opens up travel, opens up your 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 brain, right? And so it gives you it, it again. You talk always frame a reference. It allows you to see other people. And she talked specifically about poverty and and how that's different in the United States versus anywhere Because we else. live in a bubble. Certainly in the first world, we live in a bubble. Uh, yeah. A society of abundance is what she said. I loved when she said, I got lucky. I was sitting beside a, a guy doing an interview with somebody describing a job that happened to be my dream job. That, um, But, you know, she, she didn't give herself enough credit for the idea that a lot of people would be in that situation and not lean over and go, uh, excuse me, yeah, she, she that's the job I want. She, she recognized an opportunity. Yeah, exactly. She was prepared for an opportunity. What is it, a thousand hours of preparation meet one mom, moment right. of opportunity. So, that's so when, when the conversation took place, she was ready for it. Right. The preparation. All right, with that, you've got an opportunity right now to subscribe, whether it's iTunes or YouTube. Get subscribed because then, only then, will you have the accountability partners, us, in your house every day making sure you don't go off the rails with some muffins. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Tiger Bomb Active. Trust Tiger Bomb Active for proven pain relief. Get new Tiger Bomb Active in gel, rub, and convenient spray. Or look for Tiger Bomb Active at select CVS and Rite Aid locations. Pain happens. Suffering, Suffering is, is optional. optional.